Hello and welcome back to the Masters of Digital uh, 2021. I hope that you enjoyed the lunch break. I hope that you had some great breakout session in the exhibition area and that you met a lot of interesting people on our networking platform. Uh, there should be around 3000 people. So I do hope that uh, you have found it interesting and that you have found people who can, you, with whom you can share your knowledge. Um, so in the next hour or so, we will enter into discussions on a topic that is very close to my heart, uh, that is digital and health, and of course, digital health and data. It is more relevant than ever uh, seen, of course, in the light of the COVID crisis, but actually also in many, many other aspects of the health uh, subject. Today is actually the World Cancer Day, and it reminds us the importance of why we have to look at the potential of digital. This is an area that would transform how we think about diseases, how we think about treatment in the next decade dramatically. We will be able to offer proactive treatment before people are sick and not just waiting to put them in hospital when they are sick. I think we can all say mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, that if we have the choice, we have five children, the, my husband and I, that if we had a choice of them being diagnosed before to prevent that they got sick, we would definitely prefer that to them being sick and treated afterwards. This is the untapped potential of what we have on AI, on data and on health. And we must not sit back. We must use this potential to full, of course, respect and privacy when we asked the Europeans how many are willing to share their data, 86% uh, answers that they are ready to share their data if it benefits other citizens. We may need to make sure that, of course, we treat that data carefully, secure, but that we also tap into the potential of this. And we have seen a great leadership from the Commission on building the health data space during this crisis and I want to introduce the next speaker. Unfortunately, Commissioner Kirikidis could not be here with us today, but she has made a great video recorded speech and we thank her for her leadership in health in Europe. Before I do this, I would like to also hand over the word to um, Joyce Lee, Chief Information Officer of Janssen Pharmaceuticals from our member Johnson & Johnson to do a short video intro. Thank you, Commissioner Karikidis, for your leadership, and the floor is yours. Technology is changing the healthcare ecosystem and accelerating our ability to discover and deliver personalized, life-saving medicines and therapies around the world. Advancement in areas like robotics, 3D printing, natural language processing and predictive analytics have allowed us to leapfrog what's possible across the healthcare spectrum. We have a responsibility to our patients, family members and loved ones to explore these possibilities and invest in a future where disease is a thing of the past. Artificial intelligence specifically is amplifying the convergence of technology and healthcare. At Johnson & Johnson, we are applying AI to generate high value biological insights across therapeutic areas and enhance our discovery of novel targets and understanding of disease pathways. With the COVID-19 pandemic, we learn just how fragile our systems are. And by leaning into the power of AI, we accelerated our vaccine production from years to months by creating a digital twin of the production process to simulate and study end-to-end -end plant productivity, materials flow, 
equipment utilization and shift patterns. We use machine learning and artificial intelligence to understand where incident rates were high enough to warrant clinical development of our vaccine. And as a result, we develop accurate, dynamic COVID-19 prediction models to accelerate site selection and trial timeline. Going forward, we will be able to apply these predictive models to other highly mobile infectious diseases. By unlocking the power of health data and insights using AI technologies, we are providing broad access to healthcare knowledge and expertise across the globe, empowering our patients to have more control over their data, increasing the connectivity between patients, physicians, hospitals, and healthcare systems, and connecting less favored populations to higher quality services and treatment and driving towards personalized healthcare and well-being. Through the use of AI technology, we are rapidly evolving from disease treatment to disease interception and ultimately prevention. The future is nothing without humans at the centre though. And the reality is that trust is in the essence of everything we do in healthcare. In Europe, we are building a federated contracting network, Honor, partnering with close to 36 European hematology centres and 30,000 de-identified patient records, integrated and accessible through real-world evidence research. This federated collaborative network for hematology centres enables value-based healthcare through data sharing and personalised medicine. This has potential to scale to other disease areas and open access for our patients who are waiting. We must continue to work together to drive more of these collaborative, trusted partnerships. We cannot allow a sense of urgency to overrule the carefulness and objectivity with which we will take care of our data. Privacy and security must be included by design when developing the frameworks and policies that will inform how we go forward. We must respect the sensitivity of the information and handle and provide a secure digital environment where we can operate effectively and efficiently with human touch at every point. Recent healthcare security incidents have reinforced the need for a strong focus on cyber security and data protection. We must be transparent in our interpretation and explanation of AI applications to health data and avoid bias discrimination and use our power for good. The foundation that we need to make this future our reality, the people, skills and technology is present here in Europe. The Burning Platform now is implementing the policy and partnerships to address the silos and unlock the true power. No single nation or region can build this future alone and the fragmented landscape today in Europe serves as a roadblock. Through strong partnerships and a commitment to advancing human health together, we can address this fragmentation and build more opportunities globally in data access, sharing and use, while protecting the privacy of our loved ones. Europe is well positioned to drive this transformation and the world is looking at you to be a global partner and leader. It's been an honour speaking with you today on this essential topic. Now, I would like to introduce Stella Kirikaidis, European Commissioner for Health. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, during the COVID-19 pandemic, we have seen how digital technologies can be indispensable to provide healthcare access and continuity of care. Digitalization has the potential to transform healthcare and with it the lives of patients, their families and healthcare workers. It can improve our quality of life. It can boost the capacity of health systems. It can make European industry more competitive. And above all, it can save lives. And the main driver of all this is health data. This is why we have made creating a European health data space a priority. Our basic aim is to promote safe and secure cross-border health data exchange. 
This will facil facilitate better primary health care, more possibilities for scientific progress, and better evidence-based policy making. The European health data space will also foster a genuine single market in digital health services and products. The right environment to harness this potential must be built on core values like strong data protection and above all, trust. We will make sure that pooling health data is secure and patients are empowered to exercise control over their health data. I am focused on delivering a legislative proposal on the European health data space by the end of this year. This is going to be an essential building block of our European Health Union. Clearly, in creating the European health data space, we need stakeholders and member states on board. The consultation on the roadmap for this initiative closed yesterday. An open public consultation will be launched soon as well, and I encourage you all to take part. For our vision to become a reality, we need interoperable infrastructure across the Member States. Our aim is to have this in place by 2025. By the same time, we want all Europeans to be able to share their health data with the healthcare provider of their choice when travelling abroad. To make all this happen, we need to use wisely the opportunities offered by the EU budget. For instance, our ambitious EU for Health program will support investments in cross-border sharing of patients' data and in data use for research and policy making. And Member States can tap into the £672 billion of the Recovery and Resilience Facility that can support digitalization in healthcare and other public services. Furthermore, additional funding is available from other sources including the Digital Europe Programme, Horizon Europe, the European Regional Development Fund and InvestEU. Ladies and gentlemen, digitalization and the use of health data are powerful tools. That is why the European health data space is also important to fulfill the promise of Europe's beating cancer plan that I have presented yesterday. The space will be crucial in our efforts to build a post-pandemic Europe that is fit for the digital age, offering people sustainable jobs, better health and better public services. I am keen to see how the ideas that emerge from the Masters of Digital Conference can feed into these efforts. I thank you all for your attention. Good afternoon, everybody. It is my great pleasure to uh, welcome you to this session where we're going to dive into a little bit more detail on some of the issues that we have heard introduced by Commissioner Kyriakides just now. The race against time to make the use, the best use of digital health in for, for Europe. As we all know, healthcare has topped the political agenda of 2020, and in fact, it's set to remain centre stage in 2021. Digital health will play a lead role as 2021 unfolds and as the U European Union as a whole and the Member States seek to build on the increased focus on digital health that arose as a direct result of COVID-19, the use of teleconsultation, uh, the increased use of electronic prescribing, home monitoring, and of course, the plethora of app-based solutions which have come to the fore as we struggle to deliver healthcare in a context of safe distancing. As Commissioner Kyriakides has noted, the key to all of these initiatives is data. Data is the fuel which will drive these solutions. Uh, data in context of sharing patient records to facilitate remote care, uh, data to drive research, and of course, data as a key fuel to uh, train and build AI-based solutions. We are now in a race a race against time and a race on the global stage to ensure that the European Union can harness the power of digital to build more sustainable and resilient healthcare systems. We're 
going to need to do this and we're need, going to need to build on these innovations, not only to foster research and to foster innovation, but also to ensure that that research and innovation really comes to the fore and is taken up in everyday solutions for healthcare here and now. There are a huge number of challenges and opportunities that are hiding behind that label digital health. And we have an excellent panel with us here today to discuss both the challenges and opportunities of digital health and how we're going to master the race, which as I've said, is both against time and on the global stage. We're going to be covering a range of perspectives. In fact, all the perspectives that are so key in winning this race, the perspective of industry, both pharma and med tech, the perspective of policy, the perspective of technology and the infrastructure that we need, and also the sharp end of healthcare delivery. So let me introduce to you very briefly now the six panelists that we have, and also then to turn to each of them to allow them to answer a few questions and in due course, to turn over to you in the audience to ask your questions. And we will do this also with a series of polls. So let me begin by highlighting to you who we have with us on our panel today. Uh, from the policy perspective, we're delighted to have with us Pierre Delso. Pierre Delso is the new Deputy Director General of DG Sante, and he comes to DG Sante from a distinguished career in both the DG internal market and DG competition, and before that at the European Court of Justice. We really look forward to hearing more from Pierre Delso about where the future of the European health data system lies, and I'm sure a great deal more. Also on the policy side, we have with us Member of Parliament uh, Mia Petra Kumpala Natri, who represents Finland uh, in the S&D group. She has a, is well known for her keen interest in AI and in research issues, serving as Vice Chair on the Special Committee on AI in the Digital Age and as a member of ITRA. We look forward to hearing from you too. As I already noticed, we have two representatives from industry with us. Francesco Buonarotti, who is the uh, VP for IT and CIO for Janssen EMEA, um, working, good afternoon, good to have you with us, working uh, uh, with Johnson & Johnson. Johnson & Johnson are, of course, a keen user of health data, both for research and innovation. And we really look forward to hearing more about your thoughts about how we can access data and make best use of it. Also from the industry side, we have Christoph Sindel uh, from the managing on the managing uh, board of Siemens Health and Ears, a very exciting new company building on old roots, bringing digital health solutions to citizens across Europe. Delighted to have you with us. Thank you. On on as as I've described it, the sharp end of healthcare. We are very happy to have with us also Francois Crémieux, who is. Uh, Deputy CEO of the Greater Paris Region Hospitals, uh, the APHP, fighting every day to deliver healthcare. This, I'm sure 2020 was a very difficult year for you. 2021 will continue to be difficult too. Um, but we're really keen to hear from you about where you think solutions like the European Health Data Space and other solutions can help you deliver better care to patients every day. Um, and I've just noticed also that Mia Petra has joined us. Welcome, lovely to have you with us. And then uh, our sixth member is uh, Marcos Caliola from the Finnish organization CITRA, where he leads the work on uh, Health Data 2030 and also the joint action towards the European health data space. This is an initiative that is helping us build uh, the infrastructure across Europe for uh, the European health data space, which, as Commissioner Kyriakides has noted, uh, the first consultation on that ended yesterday. And we look forward not only to the thoughts of our distinguished panelists, but also to you in the audience uh, to be able to take that initiative to the next step. Uh, so with that, I'd like to say welcome to everybody, welcome to the audience, and to kick straight off with questions. And my first question is uh, to you, Christoph. It's to um, looking at the a company like Siemens Health and Ears. Uh, your company 
is of course well known. Siemens is very well known for medical diagnostics and imaging, and Siemens Health and Nears is taking much of this work to the next level. We heard, we were reminded just now by uh, Commissioner Kiriakidis that today is World Cancer Day. Can you tell us a little bit about the role of um, digital health in imaging and technology and how we can take this these solutions to the next level in, in finding treatments and solutions to beat the big cancer challenge that we're all facing? Christoph. Peter, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's a great honor to be part of this uh, panel. Yeah. Um, before we talk about the meaning of digitalization, I would like to address a few challenges we need to overcome because we should not do digitalization for the sake of digitalization. We should apply it meaningfully where it can really be of help. So one of the challenges we clearly see uh, in the healthcare systems globally, not only in the EU, is staff shortage. The world will be probably short of around 15 million healthcare workers by 2030, which is really uh, a very dramatic number, we believe. And uh, digitalization can help overcoming this challenge. We also know, um, you can see this also in the pandemic in certain areas, but in general, there is a, a increasing trend for burnout syndromes amongst the healthcare workers, not only medical doctors, but also nurses and technologists and so on. Um, studies reveal that more than 80% of these healthcare workers are prone to get really into burnout syndromes. There is uh, clearly a need for productivity, more patients, more chronic diseases in general. So productivity is helping managing the increasing number of patients. Um, a topic which is very much to my heart is also the reduction of errors and just uh, errors in the system, in the healthcare system. It's a topic which is sometimes a little bit underrepresented, and it's of course not so easy to talk about errors. But a number which struck me very much was 585 billion of waste. According to a study from the US, not up to date, 2013, but 585 billion US dollars of waste based on the fact that the processes were not following the clinical pathways and recommendations. Global healthcare coverage, when we look to the United Nations, the uh, sustainability development goals, we know that uh, less than half of the global population is covered by essential healthcare services, which is also a dramatic number. And I think this applies also for parts in the EU. And then as we already heard, the pandemic has exacerbated these problems where we know in rural areas and underserved areas, it's even worse because there is no intensive care unit, there is no ventilator and there is no infrastructure. And if healthcare workers are get infected, unfortunately, by this devastating disease, there is even a lack of staff. So when we switch over now to a lot of from a lot of problems into what could be the solution, digitalization is clearly the key. So summarizing it, I would say digitalization equals healthcare or healthcare equals digitalization. It's a disruptive change in the healthcare system for the better we believe. I just want to raise three topics where we are very active. One is telehealth. We have seen a significant increase in virtual visits globally, a significant increase of patients connecting to hospitals virtually via iPad and so on. Um, remote control of devices, which is a very important one. We have uh, been working on this topic for quite a while successfully, so we can control our modalities remotely via VPN. And in the pandemic, it has turned out to be now a big advantage because you don't need to be close to the patients uh, who might be infected. And thirdly, I would like to raise uh, a part where we have entered last year um, successfully. This is the area of robotics for interventional purposes in our case, intravascular interventions, which turns also out to be a big plus, not only to reduce dosage for the healthcare workers, for the operators, for the medical doctors in the room, but also remote control the intervention and uh, being, let's say, in distance to the patients. Finally, AI is certainly um, a very disruptive technology we are heavily working on. 
and we see a huge potential because it is helping, I mean, analyzing big data. It is helping managing complex diseases. And uh, we talked about cancer already beforehand, which is a summary of 200 diseases roughly. So also appreciate now that uh, the EU has uh, announced now the beat cancer program again and is active in this field for so many years, which is, uh, in my point of view, very important. I'm personally a medical doctor, so uh, it uh, is a very positive thing. And um, we do two things to be uh, short here. One is a companion concept where we develop tools for the automated analysis of images. You can apply them to mammography. You can apply them to CT images, complex CT images in the chest. And AI helps to automatically detect findings, which is helping, you know, in terms of um, uh, productivity increase. We name it companion because we believe for the time which we can foresee there will not be a replacement of medical expertise, human beings in the healthcare systems by AI. And lastly, I would like to address our pathway companion, which is a system based on medical guidelines for example, in cancer, take prostate cancer, and we take multiple data sources like images, lab data, and so on, and combine them into a meaningfully few and help the physicians, the tumor boards, the uh, interdisciplinary exchange, help them to get a risk assessment, treatment recommendations, and so on, helping at the end, personalizing the treatment much more than, the, uh, than in the past. So. I recall when I studied medicine in the last century, um, it was a cookie cutter approach. Everybody got, let's say, with the same diagnosis, the same treatment. We know this is wrong and we know that every individual reacts uh, uh, individually to certain uh, uh, treatments. From that point of view, um, we believe AI can also help not only managing cost and driving productivity, but also reducing errors in the system and increasing quality of care. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you've given us a, a, a massive list of benefits that digital can bring. Uh, I'm delighted to see that you've covered not only some of the obvious, more obvious things from a from a technology company such as robotics and telehealth, but also touched on some of the softer issues such as addressing burnout and staff shortages and also noting that uh, the world is not even when it comes to healthcare. So. Um, I'm going to move on in a minute to a uh, member of parliament, Mia, member of parliament, Mia Patra. But before doing that, I just want to offer the audience an opportunity to respond to a poll. So we will open a poll, uh, and then while you're answering that poll, I will begin with asking uh, Mia Patra a question. And we're going to have a poll at the end as well. Uh, the poll will also serve to to help us uh, focus some of our questions as we go on. So the first poll, and if I can make sure that my colleagues in the background are ready to launch the first poll. The question for the first poll is, as data privacy rules stand today in the EU, would you as a citizen and patient share your health data for scientific research? And I'm sure our colleagues from the Commission uh, and from the Parliament will be very interested to hear your, your, your answers to that. Um, but uh, let me now turn to Mia Petra to ask uh, to ask you for your thoughts on particularly the European health data space. Uh, we know that the European health data space is, is a huge initiative that the Commission has just launched. Um, it can, of course, and it is designed to be as a, a source of data to train AI, to train the algorithms uh, that we hope will be able to address some of the opportunities that Christoph has outlined for us. What do you see as the primary challenges of the European health data space, particularly in aspects such as ensuring a high quality of data? Thank you. Thank you, and I very much appreciate the broad introduction from Christoph to start with a very, very 
uh, good analyzing what is possible and where should we go uh, on the data space on health uh, uh, it is one of the data spaces but then also the more urgent and 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 more concrete at the moment whereas in where plans are to have similar in transportation where you can concretely imagine what is needed when you have more uh, clever or uh, wise uh, objects moving on the roads and so but on the on the health uh, also the covid helped the, the understand the need for for this one so the the really to see the uh, legal proposal is the way to come from commission and that's why the opinions of the citizens are uh, very uh, interesting in this point but at the moment we do the dga the data governance act that also builds uh, the way towards uh, having the data spaces also uh, and, and then for the governance, uh, we have a Markus Kalleola from Finland, so I will not go to the details of FinData, but I, I kind of understand that the secondary use of health data and structures for that has been also the motivating idea that how you can use the sensitive data so that it can be trusted and it will be uh, uh, also uh, like banking has a rule so data has to have a rule and if i can trust my monies to be treated as a data for the banks i can uh, answer that question that yes i can uh, then in the good governance i can trust my data to be used on my health data for the benefit of the good for the research or me and i liked very much that it was also the idea that ai is not only uh, uh, analyzing masses analyzing virus but persons more carefully because we do vary so the where i see the risk of the high quality data to be i uh, have to say that um, i see many risks on biased data and i uh, have been speaking a lot on this and many said but in the medical world it's not a problem you have such much data but then i read, uh, read a book about the statistics and women and not even in the uh, medical uh, world is it uh, taken into consideration that the data is handled the gender uh, sensitive way so this is just one example of the data biases that is one risk but i think i can also say that high quality data exists a lot but it is not re uh, reached and it is not cataloged it is not machine readable form there is no standards and, and there is no uh, interoperability so I'm still the strong advocate having the data spaces, but not having the data pools that now we will have a big, big uh, central, centralized data uh, for European Cancer Day, for the cancer research, for example. But I'm a strong believer that it is up to date data, real time data that the hospitals have, that we do as a single person have, if we manage to make a personal data um, space around in the, the data structures that we do. So then combining these data. Uh, for the necessity, for the need, from the decentralized sources, that is something that we could benefit in the European uh, internal market for the uh, more availability, for the training, but then also the more precisely to what is it needed. And that is also creating the trust then for uh, all the participants, the companies, the smaller ones to play with the bigger ones, not to lose the data they have, but also for the individuals. Thank you, thank you. That's introduced some some very interesting points. Now we we had while you were speaking, we had the results of the poll that came in, and we see that seventy six percent of our audience say they would be willing to share their data for scientific research, and I think that that points to what you were saying about we do have a wealth of data available. Uh, I'm sure um, Mr. Delsul will want to come back to some of that when when we come to his questions. It means, of course, that 24% are not willing to. So that still leaves some challenges. You mentioned the Digital Governance Act as a tool for addressing some of those challenges. But I wonder whether I could ask you just one quick additional question. It, it's not only about trust. Um, that willingness to share data is heavily dependent on trust, but it's also to do with digital literacy. We need to really understand what is going to happen with our data uh, and why it might be used. Have you got any thoughts on what we can do at European level to improve digital literacy so that people do have the willingness to share their data? 
hard to link them uh, just to the, the, the data sharing, but in overall the digital solutions. So it is, of course, understanding. I, I use the, the comparison that the watching the movies, you should kind of understand it's a ketchup or a trick on the, on the murder you see on the television. So it is the same way that understanding the world where we are, what digitalization means. Uh, and, and then, for example, uh, how the, the Siemens health engineer uh, represented the way that also AI is not replacing fully, but it, and it's not artificial intelligence. It should be less artificial, but more intelligence is also the way I think we should talk about the issues for the citizens to be then uh, knowing. But then one, once I, I've seen the phenomenon, the, the more we speak about it, the more we handle and openly also the problems, if we start hiding the problems, then we are lost. But when we openly talk about it, people start thinking that, do I uh, trust only one person uh, the doctor to, to put my life on an, uh, individual hands or is it better that he has uh, a supportive AI or supportive digital analysis because of course there are human uh, errors uh, as there are systemic errors so then combining it should create more trust but I, I, I call for the open debate uh, and then hard to say but crises are even teaching us more than the business as usual among the uh, only the stakeholders or those who are uh, keen and specialists on the subject thank thank you very much uh, i'm sure you're going to have an exciting year with the dga and other tools coming on online to uh, really help build that trust and build that capacity and with any luck it will help us address the fears of that 24 percent in our poll just now which is nevertheless uh, some six seven hundred people who have answered that um we still need to do something to to, to build that trust and build that data literacy let me move now to our, our third uh, speaker, um, Francesco Buonarroti from uh, Janssen and from Janssen and, and Johnson and Johnson. Um, I, I'm keen to hear from you also on on the use of the European Health Data Space and how you think it can help a company like Johnson and Johnson uh, build more sustainable and more resilient healthcare systems. I think we've all learned with COVID that resilience, whether it is a personal resilience, as Crystal pointed out, um, in the face of, of actually working day by day through the COVID crisis, or the resilience of the healthcare system uh, in the larger sense, what can the European health data space and actually digital health in general do to build that resilience? Yeah, first of all, thank you for having me. And uh, I think it's an interesting coincidence that uh, we have a panel on uh, racing against time at the World Day uh, Cancer. So, uh, and that's, that's uh, I think, all of what we do is at the end of the day, uh, patients are waiting uh, for, for what we do. And I think it's an exciting time. And as a CIO, we see the technology progress and I see the science progress and the biology progress. And I think there is a number of things that are possible that were not thinkable years ago. Uh, and this is happening now already. Uh, I mean, if I see uh, at Janssen in the discovery process, how data science is helping uh, to predict efficacy and safety, and safety of, of a new molecular entity or, or how uh, the use of neural and neural not network are helping in uh, enabling in clinical trials um, faster recruitment of patient, patients in rare progressive disease like pulmonary hypertension. So there's, there's, we have to unlock uh, the, the potential of data and data is opening with, with, the, with the progress that we have and a number, uh, an enormous uh, potential and opportunities that we have. And as mentioned by Cecilia, not only in the curative space, but, but I think we dream to go in a preventive space uh, when we have all the data available. I think to help decisions makers uh, and, and lawmakers at this point in time to target investment effectively and, and make healthcare more sustainable, healthcare, healthcare systems should embrace more the use of real world data. Uh, and, and when we speak about real world data, we speak about traditional real world evidence that, that we know um, in, and then collectively and routinely collected in, in hospital via electronic health records, disease registries, but also 
on the other side, the use of patients report data from, from apps and other digital technology. I think embracing the use of, of real world data will open the possibility for targeted and personalized treatments on one hand and innovative medicine, but also in the day to day uh, medical practice in primary care. In primary care. I think, uh, for example, uh, data can drive healthcare system efficacies by moving towards outcome based models where spending can be targeted on interventions that deliver the, the greatest value. So for sure we are uh, uh, speaking and supportive of the European health data space uh, as a big progress and, and looking forward to the policy which is coming at the end of the year. I think we have to face three major challenges to, to unlock the full potential. And, and one, and there was some reference already by, uh, by, by the member of parliament, Mia Petra Campula, was, was uh, fragmented interpretation and implementation of rules that we see today in the data access and sharing. Um, the lack of interoperability that we see in the system where data are collected and held, uh, and the lack of implementation of standards to ensure when the data that we have are sufficient quality to, you, to be used for research and innovative medicine. Uh, and I think one of the thousand learnings that we had through the COVID-19 period is shown how health data collection is important and real-time tracking for disease transmission, epidemiological re research, for discovery and identification of, of, of treatment is crucial in the time for finding a cure and also preventive cure like vaccines. Um, and, and it also highlighted some weakness. I think if I remember the first time of the, of, of the pandemic and we speak about data, we were not even able to compare new, in Europe mortality as we had different, mm -hmm. uh, different rules of identify uh, mortality and also uh, we have already policy at European level, but as an industry, we are facing different interpretation country by country. We have delays in, in setting up clinical trials because we have different interpretation of GDPR for use of secondary data in the different member states. Uh, and that is not here, even the industry, I think, uh, healthcare systems based on trust. And I think when we speak about use of data and health data and personal data, we have to have the highest level of protection and highest level of, of uh, ethical use of data. And it's important that lawmakers and policymakers help us in the use of, in, in the interpretation for this. Um, we are a believer also of what was mentioned of federated uh, data models. And uh, uh, when we speak about federated data models, we speak about federated network with a fair access. And when we speak about fair, in this case, it's fundable, accessible data, interoperable data, reusable data. Uh, and, and federated data models, we believe they can uh, remove some ba barriers on accessing the health data on one hand, ensuring the highest level of protection uh, for personal data and, and the commercial use uh, and research use on the other. Um, and, and I believe nothing will work without data standardization. Uh, we have to work on, on data standardization, the healthcare. Uh, we are spending months already in one of the uh, Janssen and Johnson & Johnson leading one of the European initiative of the IMI on the Eden project where we are trying to standardize 100,000 uh, data sets of different clinics. And it's a multi-year effort that we are facing just to have one standard that we can compare what we have. I mean, we have done and, and, and uh, also in, in my team, we are cooperating on what was mentioned in one of the inter introductory video of on, on OUR, the hematology outcomes network in Europe, which is one example federated network where the data never leave the clinic, uh, mm -hmm. but a subset of standardized data is able to anonymize, standardize, is able to use for, for research. Uh, and uh, on one hand, uh, for the clinic to compare treatment path from a clinic to another and for us to have scientific question and, and, and real world evidence usage for efficacy of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of treatment and medicine that we produce. So uh, in, in the observation we have, I think we, we see member states go at different pace and, and, and it's not, I think, a, 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 a case that we have two members of uh, two Finland <laughs> members. I think Finn data is one of the best uh, mm -hmm. example that, that we see. We see also France moving with the health data hub, uh, but in other areas, I don't think we see any advancement. So uh, I think from an industry perspective, uh, we, we, we seek the EU coordination in the effort. And uh, Petra, I very much agree with your 
awards at the beginning is, is a race on, on, on uh, European stage, but also a race on global stage uh, in order to have European not losing importance in, in the research in this, in this transformation of healthcare. Thank you very much. I think you've, you've just come up there with the, the ideal wish list of what we would really like the European Union to do to help us succeed both at EU level and on that global stage. And, and for me, you, you've summarised it in, in three key things. Address fragment, fragmentation of the rules, drive interoperability and use standards to do that. Because I think, as you summarised it, if we don't have fair data, we probably might not, we might not need data at all. That I think links us very nicely to talking to uh, Francois Camus because uh, you work in a group of hospitals, the ABHP, which must uh, create and use huge amounts of data every day. Can you tell us a little bit about how useful that data is, how much use you are able to make of that data and what challenges you might be facing in terms of making data work for you? So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me today and thanks Petra for um, moderating this session. Thanks very much to, um, to all of you. Uh, first of all, yes, we do gather a huge amount of data. Uh, as many of you know, APHB, the Greater Paris University Hospitals, is a um, very integrated group of uh, university hospitals of the Greater Paris region. And so it's a group of about 39 hospitals. We care for about 8 million patients per year. So it's, it's a big amount of everything, a big amount of care, a big amount of research, a big amount of teaching, and it's therefore an enormous amount of data. And so we have one um, electronic health record system and, and only one data warehouse. And so um, we do have um, that raw material of medical data that is dumped every day into that data warehouse. And, and the potential is enormous, as is the potential of many, many data warehouses of many big uh, university hospitals in, in Europe. Now, what are the challenges? I think that a couple of years ago, I would probably have started with technical issues, telling you that the big challenges were technical challenges. That, I think, is no more the case. Um, it was, it's no more. And so I would um, uh, strengthen two big challenges. The first one is uh, scales and IT uh, human resources to work on data to make sure that we transform raw material, data coming directly from individual health records and, and collected in all the, um, we have 800 wards that are collecting data. And we need to transform that raw material into a clean and meaningful health data. Uh, we all know the famous sentence about garbage in, garbage out. In the health sector, garbage in, you just get nothing out, not even garbage. Um, because we cannot use uh, um, unmeaningful, unstructured um, um, uh, data for anything. And so the, the specific problem with human resources is that it's very difficult to overcome the challenge in the context of a very tense labor market for these skills. Um, the, the good professionals and the good experts are expensive and they have a high tendency to work for hospitals at the beginning of their careers and then move on to a better paid jobs in the industry. And so the first challenge is to make sure that at the, on the ground where data is collected, we have some good human resources um, able to, um, to, to get that raw material into meaningful health data. The second challenge is the business model that is around all this. Um, we've talked together, Petro, about the fact that data might be one day considered as a common good. I mm. think it will be, I hope it will be, and, and I'm very keen on, on talking about a common good, talking about health data. A common good does not mean that it's a good for free. It's a very expensive good. It's, a, it's an expensive good because we need to spend time on that raw material the uh, individual data to make it uh, meaningful for research and, and development. And so um, APHP, for example, is being paid or financed by the uh, French national social security system, but we're being financed to care for people, to treat them. We're not being financed to work on the data and to transform the raw material into something that be that could be used by many of you to do uh, AI or anything else. So my second big challenge today is to get the um, uh, sustainable, business model so that we have the possibility to produce high quality health data. Thank you, that's, uh, that's uh, some really important things that you've highlighted there. Um, so let me then put you on the spot a little bit. You have the opportunity here of not only a big audience of European influencers, but also a member of parliament and um, a senior leader in the European Commission. 
what would you like the European actors to do to address those issues that you've mentioned, particularly of, of the skills shortage and the business model, so that we can uh, move beyond a, a garbage in, nothing out, as you've so distinctly put it. Well, again, I think that there's one problem, despite the poll, um, I think that um, more than 75% of European citizens are ready to share their data. And I think the poll today is rather pessimist um, about that issue. At least when, when, when we work when we when we when we work with patient representatives at APHP, um, I wouldn't say it's 99%, but it's probably close to that. 99% of patients are ready to share that data at two conditions. The first condition is that we ought to be more transparent about what we do with the data, and so we need to make sure that we're transparent not only at the at, I mean at all levels at the European level, at the national level, at the hospital level, in the ward, when you take your kids or your relative to a ward, you should know what the data has been collected for. That transparency today is not sufficient and sometimes does not, does not exist. The second condition on top of transparency is that patients want to have their say on what we're going to do, what the strategy is going to be on data using. And so the second big issue is to move on top, not only of on, on transparency, but also on sharing the strategy with patients representatives and probably with members of parliament. And coming back on your question, what do we expect from um, uh, European leaders? Well, regarding the business model, you need to take that into account and do not think that by just creating the um, uh, health data hub in France, for example, or a data lake or, or, or digital world, digital, um, um, uh, world at, the, um, at the European level, um, you need to pay, you need to finance, we need to work on the um, raw material again to make it such mm -hmm. that uh, we get some good data um, in your hands. Otherwise, it's not going to be the case. So we need to find the way of uh, financing this. And uh, if it's public, whether it's public or private money does not matter much to me, but whoever puts money into the system has to have some kind of return on investment, whether it's public or private money. That I think is insufficiently organized today. Well, wow, that's raised some big issues, and I'm hoping that uh, some other people will still come in on that. Uh, we are taking questions from the audience. I'm going to continue with asking some questions now, but I will begin to build in the questions from the audience. So do please uh, feel free to continue uh, writing your questions. Thank you very much, Francois. I would now like to, to move to Marcus Haliola from Citra in Finland. Uh, you, you have, you're wearing a double hat. You're not only uh, looking at health data in Finland, but also at a European level with the, with the TEDAS project. And we've just heard two things that I think really uh, will be driving the work you do. The need for transparency and clarity about how we go about sharing data. But also, if you like some of the, the real world context, the, the strategies, the business models and how we report on return on investment. So um, I'd like to begin by asking you about uh, TEDAS, the, the um, work that you're doing in terms of the European health data space, uh, but invite you also to bring in your experiences from Finland, because we know, of course, that Finland really is a leader in this field. So. Um, how do you see the big challenges of TEDAS and how are you going to, to uh, solve the problems? Not a difficult question, just tell us how you're going to solve all the problems. Yes, thank you, Petra. And good afternoon from my side as well and thank you for the invitation to this, to this panel. Really, uh, before answering your question regarding how we're going to solve all the problems, I'd like to uh, congratulate on the previous speakers and the very good points that you have made and uh, maybe comment to some of the discussions that already started. So as, as Mia Petra said, uh, the European Health Data Space is just one of the data spaces. And one of the important topics is that we understand what is horizontal and what is, what is sectoral. And this is something that I try also to, to highlight to the, to the participants of the, of the data joint action. And uh, in, in that, the, one of the important topics is that it's the uh, the Data Governance Act that was proposed by the Commission last November. So there, there we have some models already for the for the secondary use of, of, of public sector data. And uh, we need to understand how that links to the healthcare sector when we come up with our own proposals. Now, uh, the data strain action actually started on, on Monday this week. So we don't have answers yet, 
we have questions that, uh, as, as you have. So how we are going to face those questions exactly uh, that has been discussed already today. And one of the main questions, and I, I fully agree, uh, agree with, uh, with uh, Francois uh, in, in the last uh, statement, saying that the clear processes are, are, are the key. And this is also the lesson learned from Finland. So this is what we did in 2019. We, we, we established a new act on the secondary use of health and social data. And uh, since last year, we, we have had the FinData uh, institution operating, which give permissions for data uh, in a clear process. That is, is it is visible for, for all how the uh, access to data is being granted in Finland. So I think uh, with, with Francois, and, and with me, I just comment. I think these are the are the key issues that we need to think. How mm -hmm. Tehdas then uh, how Tehdas then uh, approaches those is that we have 26 countries uh, that are uh, participating. The, the participants are nominated by by the ministries of health on, on the on, on the national level, and we we come together to discuss these topics and different work packages uh, that some deal with the governance, other data quality, infrastructure questions such as those. So uh, you will see in uh, within already this year, we start giving options for the governance, uh, for the data quality and infrastructure, also data uh, altruism that was discussed today for the European Commission. But maybe I, I close with this, that we are not a project that makes the decisions. We are a preparatory body for the commission to then propose the European Health Data Space proposal on the, on the legal act by the end of this year. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure that notwithstanding the fact that you have some excellent, many excellent people on the work packages, this is going to be a big job. But I also know that the, the, the Commission colleagues are, are really looking forward to the output from your work and will be able to use that to really address uh, some of the big challenges that, that are facing them. And, and with that, I'd like to turn to our last speaker, uh, Pierre, Pierre Del Sur. Um, of course, much of what we're, what we're talking about sits within DG Sante, sits within the initiative of the European Health Data Space and its relationship with the Data Governance Act. Um, and we've noted that uh, questions from the audience have included, what is the commission going to do to really help build citizens' trust in sharing data? Um, and on that question, I would like you to um, maybe expand a little bit on the uh, newly developing concept of data altruism and what we can do and what the Commission plans to do to build the trust to allow data altruism to flourish. Over to you. Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. Many thanks for having invited me to this very interesting event and also to this panel because what I can take note that basically we share all the same approach, which is something which is important because for something which is so important than health. Now, turning to the question, and I would like maybe to come back to your poll. It's interesting that we have, you know, you could say, look at the positive side, three quarters of people are willing to share their data. But as you said, one quarter is not willing. And here we are at an event talking about digital Europe. So I can suppose that the people who are attending this event are actually already convinced about the benefits of digital and digitalization. So if we were to make the same poll outside of you know, this particular audience, probably the result would be even worse. So that's, that's effectively a problem that we need to address. I don't have a magic solution. First of all, let me maybe stress a bit of paradox that the same people who are not willing to share the data for health purposes don't have a problem on the social networks to explain everything about their life, you know, you know everything. And when they are sick, you see picture of them being sick. But maybe they are not, those same, pe same people are not willing to share this information for, you know, scientific purposes or maybe to, to help them. So that's a paradox, but this paradox in which we live and we have no choice about that. So that's the first comment, maybe first remark. Second element, what can we do to change this? I believe the first, first message is we need basically to explain the benefits. Look at the COVID crisis, you know, we have many lessons stemming from the COVID crisis, many bad lessons and some a little bit more positive lessons. One le clear lesson is health is a fundamental asset. If we don't have health, nothing will function in our society. 
Sometimes we have, you know, we have forgotten about this because in the past everything was globally okay. Of course, you still have people being sick, dying, and so on. But you know, it was not perceived as this. And so the issue of health was not maybe not on the top of the agenda. Now it is because everybody has realized that without health, you have no way out. So you need to have health. The second message also of the one of the second message of the COVID crisis is the fact that health, if health is a priority, you need also to have resilient health system. If you don't have resilient health systems, you will be in a situation where people will continue to die massively. So the resilience of the health system is fundamental for all citizens. And maybe a third message also from the crisis is the fact that we have a pandemic now. I hope we will be out soon. I don't know when exactly. But one thing which is clear, one day we will have another pandemic. And I don't know the nature of this pandemic. And so to come back to your question, if we want to convince people of you know, sharing their data and being uh, more open to this question, we need to explain to them, actually, we don't do it just for the sake of doing it, to create problems, to get access, but simply to build this element, to build a better healthcare system, to give scientific the possibility to use those data to bring more research and more innovation, which will be able to cope, you know, with future diseases or future situations. And we need also to explain that also, even if you don't like it, but having good data on health helps also to take, you know, the good policy decision. Look at the situation in which we are now, where people are actually fighting, do we need to open, do we need to do lockdown and so on? We need to have data to have an informed decision by policymakers. So that's something which is important from their point of view. So my first message to, to convince those people, besides the paradox I mentioned at the beginning, is let's try to explain the benefits. And let's be clear, if we want to build a resilient health system in the future, it will not be possible without a digital dimension. It's all, digital is already present now, it's already being used, but we need to deepen this. We need to do more. That's the first important message to convey to the population. It's not a magic solution, but I believe it's important. The second dimension which, on which we need to work, and that's something which is important, of course, that we need also to show the guarantees which are there. Because, of course, there is a fear, you know, what are they going to do with my data? They will know about everything, about me, you know. And we should explain that all the guarantees are there, that actually data privacy is a key element of what, what, what we want to do, that we need to put all the safeguards to make sure that data privacy will not be affected. And that, I believe, is something which is important. By the way, to come back to one of the remarks which has been made by one of you, it's true also that the way data privacy rules are being implemented in the different member states is not exactly the same, which in itself triggers some problems and some difficulties of interoperability between us. So that's, we, we, are, we are aware of this obstacle. But so again, we need, we need to work on this and to show that actually we have built and we will build enough guarantees to make sure actually that the system we will put into place will, will not uh, protect, will not attempt the uh, life, the private life of citizens. I believe this is something which is important. And maybe my last message, you know, as the commissioner has said, we are going to make a legislative, and several of you have said, we are going to make a legislative proposal. But we are still now in a phase where we're in the consultation phase. And we want to bring all stakeholders on board. We are not going, you know, I'm a bureaucrat, I'm not going to invent a legislative proposal in my office alone, uh, just uh, you know, really alone now because of the lockdown. But, you know, in my office really alone, it's not the way it will be done. What we want to do is to have an inclusive process. So you have now, all of you, but also everybody, has now an opportunity to help us to prepare a legislation which will be fit for purpose, which will help us to deliver what we want, which is basically a system, health system, which will be more effective, more resilient, giving the possibility for research and innovation, but also protecting citizens' rights. So it's now. So take the opportunity. We will listen to you. You know, you can do it through digital, even if you want to write a letter, we'll read letters, but email is probably better from that point of view. Mm -hmm. But still, we, we count on you. We need you, all of you, to help us to prepare something which you know will be a good proposal and of course the parliament member state will be there to make sure that we uh, we reach this but again let's be very clear we live in a world where digital will be present you know let's you know our economy is functioning now because of the digital partly at least because of the digital you know it will continue to grow we cannot change this so we need to take the to make the best of it also in the health sector and you know i'm an old man 
I still remember when the first computer became, you know, common and, you know, that you had them in the offices. People were afraid and saying, what is it? What is it going to do? What will be the consequences? Now, everybody, almost everybody has a smartphone, uh, you know, a tablet or a computer, of course. It's, a computer is even already old fashioned to a certain extent. So it's part of our daily life. So let's also use this in the health sector, because to come back to my initial point, health is fundamental. We cannot live, we cannot have a society functioning without a perfect health system. So we need that and we need a digital. And, you know, to come one last sentence, you know, it will be challenging. But for those who know the movie, you know, failure is not an option. We need to deliver on this. Thank you very much. And I think with that, we have a, a nice connection between our two uh, representatives. Uh, I, I know, of course, at the Commission, you're no longer French, but from France, it's uh, not, it's a case of uh, no failure allowed and no garbage in, no garbage out. Be careful, I'm Belgian, so you're extremely ah. happy when you're making, you know, French speaking, Whoa. but Belgian, so be careful, be careful. Oh, my word. Now, you see, it didn't say that in my briefing. What a terrible it's, crime it's, I've committed. It's, it's data privacy, that's important. I'm so sorry. Well, clearly your, your privacy was well respected because I didn't exactly. know that, and I'm, I'm humbly sorry. Um, however, I do want to, uh, just to reiterate the things that you've said, the one of the things you particularly focused on there was the the need to show benefit to show and i think it was also mentioned by by others on the panel to show real return on investment return on investment to individuals for giving their data but also return on investment that we need to make in in making data usable and we don't we have about 10 minutes left and there's a question that's come in which is slight to be honest not a question i would have predicted but i think it's one that was hinted at in some of the presentations that we've had some of the comments we've had which is about the need to really invest in training in the human resources in the people who are going to use these systems whether it is as Francois has said the data scientists who are going to ensure that the raw data is turned into something usable or the clinicians and and actually training the clinicians something I think also that um, Francois hinted at the, the clinicians need to be uh, trained to actually collect the right data because in order for raw data to turn, real world data turn, uh, turn into real world evidence, we need to collect it in the right way. So uh, I wonder which of our panelists would like to, to answer that question from the audience about um, what we can do to really address some of that human resource gap that we have at the moment, some of that skills gap. Do I have a, a taker? If uh, you allow, uh, very Please. quickly, yeah? I mean, this uh, is a very important topic and I'm very grateful for the question. I mean, what we have started also um, accelerated by the pandemic is really a broad portal where we explain the technologies we develop. Yeah? I think it's, it's really important that we gain acceptance and also trust the same discussion as we had uh, over the last minutes. And um, having this available globally, for everybody is important and then working very closely together with the medical societies because at the end they need to take this as well and they do in germany we know radiologists and so on uh, the german society of radiology is very active in this for example but others as well um, they take this also into their programs and need to make this uh, a fixed part ai and digitalization and training related to it, it cannot only uh, come from the industry, it should not only come from the industry, it needs to be supported by the medical societies as well. Thank you, that, that's really helpful. Anybody else like to comment on that? Uh, Mr. Delso, please do no, go I, ahead. I, I certainly not, I fully agree with what has been said by, by Christophe in this respect. Still one aspect, one dimension on which I would like to insist, and it has been also mentioned by the commissioner herself, is the fact if we talk about you know the EU 27 member states you have also different situation in the different member states 
And even within the same member states, you have different situations within the same member state. Not all regions, not everybody is in the same situation. So, of course, this question is fundamental, but we also need to make sure that actually this kind of technology is really being spread all across the 27 member states everywhere. Because again, and this is also linked to the previous question, if we really want to build some kind of adherence to this idea, we need to make sure it's not something which is just done only in some parts of Europe, in some parts of one particular country, but is globally everywhere. And so from that point of view, as a commission, we also want to look at, you know, the, you know, means, financial means, which could be also used because it's also important. You know, nobody, none of you has mentioned this aspect. You know, when you talk about, uh, you talk about digital illiteracy, which is important, but sometimes in some places you don't have a computer. It's not, not an easy access to computer or to a network or to internet, which is functioning well. You know, so we need also to look, look at that dimension to make sure that if we build something in digital health, it's not only for a few regions, a few cities, but it's globally for all our citizens in the 27 member states. It's challenging, it's difficult, but I believe we have no choice. We need to do it all together again. Thank you very much. That's that's great. And uh, we're we're coming to the last five minutes of our panel. Um, and in order to give our panelists some some something to take away, I want to ask one more poll question, and then I'll come back with a couple more questions to the audience. Uh, sorry, to the panel. So the the second poll question builds on the first one. A number of you said that you were willing to share data. So the harder question then is. Do you think the European Union can act as the trusted guardian of your health data? So this goes to, to the core of what the, the uh, European health data space and the concept of data altruism is about. So we'll open that poll and I'll report on the results of that just before we close the session. But I'd like to know, can I go back to our, our audience? And uh, I would like to ask, um, particularly to take us into the here and now of not only uh, the COVID pandemic in which we're living, but also uh, World Cancer Day. And I would like each of you to, to just give me, as we, as we move towards the end of this session, a, a couple of sentences, no more than that, on where you think digital health can help us uh, overcome the challenges of something like COVID or meeting the, the objectives of the cancer plan. What is it that digital health can do to take us to that next step? Um, and um, would somebody like to start us off or shall I pick on somebody? Well, I, I can start from 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 uh, involved in the in the COVID ninety from from one side of uh, from the pharmaceutical side. I, I think it helps in all the different the different aspect um, of the of the value chain that you have in in uh, bringing uh, um, curative or preventive uh, core. I mean, it's discovery, uh, accelerate discovery. It's accelerating uh, trials. It is uh, um, accelerating production uh, and also being sure that you target the right population at the right moment when you distribute. So I believe those are all, uh, however, for sure, when we have the new pandemic, we don't know at the beginning what it is, but we have perhaps enough now data to see what is similar uh, and what core that have worked for, for other things can, can eventually work. Uh, but there's also a reminder uh, and last sentence uh, that is not only uh, in European, I think it's a global scale. And when we speak about data flows, I think we have to, to, to improve in Europe, but also to think that research like in the pandemic is a global matter and not only a regional matter. Thank you very much. Now, I've realized that I overpromised by saying that I would give everybody the chance to speak. Commissioner, sorry, the president of the commission is speaking next, so we will not have time to go very much uh, into everybody's detail. Um, Marcus, you asked for the floor to make a, a comment on this issue. Yes, I'll be very quick. So I think Francisco said most of the things I wanted to say. So on the preventive side, of course, the data can do a lot of things on a personal level, but also on on a, on a society level. So we can prevent the future uh, epidemics from from growing by by monitoring uh, the, the the infected people uh, and the growth of infections. And on a personal level, we can do a lot of the preventive side from improving our own lives uh, personally. And then, of course, on the, on the sick care and on the healthcare side. We can find new treatments and, and, and that kind of thing. So I think the data will be the key uh, to transform our healthcare. Yeah. 
in, in all ways. So, Thank you very much. Uh, Francois, you would like to have a, a last word, yeah. I think. Yeah, in just one sentence, I think digital should the uh, digital issue should help us speed up everything, speed up care, speed up research, speed up teaching, and speed up everything at the individual and collective level. That's the big issue of the coming years. Well, thank you for, for providing that lovely summary, because as we said at the beginning, it's a race. And one thing that's helpful in a race is speed. So you've tied it up very nicely there. Um, I would like to end this session because we will hear from uh, President von der Leyen next, but I also want to leave you with the result of the poll, which has nudged us a little bit further in the right direction because 80% of you said that you do believe the European Union can act as trusted guardian of your health data. So I think that's positive. It still leaves us some way to go, but I'd like to very much thank our six panelists. It's been a great pleasure to chair you. And uh, I urge you now to uh, listen to what President von der Leyen has to say to us. Thank you very much indeed and goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very you. much.